So thanks everyone for, for bearing with us and, and joining today. Uh, I'll try to get through this quickly so that way we have a little bit more uh, inflection time as a group uh, to, to think about this and, and to kind of share our insights as we go through this. Uh, that being said, I'll start with a quote from Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces. And so this is really like the, the thesis that, you know, the hero's journey it was where the hero ventures forth from the world of the common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. And the hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. That should sound, that pattern should sound really familiar. It, it's kind of a recipe for, for some of the, the greater stories. Uh, but Joseph Campbell's theory is that that story and recognizing it is kind of embedded uh, collectively throughout humanity because we find this pattern in all sorts of cultures and all sorts of history. And so uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about myself, uh, an overview of what I see as the, one of the problems that we have right now with the, the DevOps movement uh, and, and kind of reskilling it, uh, our organic talent as, as a solution and using these patterns and these stories as a means to kind of detect where we are, our role, and how we can help pull some of these efforts through these different transitions and thresholds. And what I hope uh, the, the insight that, that you'll find is that often uh, there's a lot out in the unknown, uh, things that we haven't done, things that we don't know. And typically we will sometimes feel like the answer is out there. And so we're gonna, we're gonna pull a team together and we're gonna go out there and find the answer only to go through these trials and tribulations and realize in the end uh, th through that, that trial that that answer was within us the whole time. The, the team, you, your skills and things like that, it, it was the, the secret to success the whole time but it was going through that process that, that you kind of achieved it. Uh, so a little bit about me, I'm just here in a personal capacity. I am an active duty major in the Marine Corps, uh, originally from Florida, commissioned via the Naval Academy in 2007, uh, started out as a logistics officer, did, did time uh, on the, with ground units, uh, transitioned into technology, became an information scientist, uh, just finished a tour in the Pentagon as a technology consultant for the Chief Information Officer of the Marine Corps. Uh, so here today, in, in a personal capacity as a member of the, the DevOps community of practice, so nothing in here is, uh, I'm not representing the, the DOD or any government agency. These stories and these anecdotes are based on my experiences and personal observations uh, while I've gone through that, though. So just a, a quick overview uh, of what we think that this problem could be, and what I hope drew you into the, this dialogue today, uh, that digital talent for, for these, you know, the, the teams that are doing the DevOps patterns, it, they're really hard to get, they're hard to keep. And uh, what, it, what if we reskilled our current workforce? And, you know, the value proposition there is that, you know, we already have them and we're in the best position to transform them. And so the, the model that we could use is this hero's journey. So uh, everyone has a role to play, you know, those who are joining those teams, those who are leading them, those who are enabling them, and uh, answering this call into that unknown of what DevOps and, and, and that has to offer, and realizing again that the elixir isn't out there, it's, it's hidden within, but we still need to go through uh, th these patterns to get those insights and in, in that kind of experience. So what this is, is to help us do is to know where we are, where those thresholds and transitions are and help pull people through it and how we keep leveling up. And the biggest part is uh, that you should take away from this is telling the story. So as you tell the story, this should help you figure out that pattern of what the story is and, and how to kind of explain what we've been through and where those challenges are. Now, this I found uh, in between doing this talk and, and uh, today, this is something that a consultant at Amplitude shared. And this is what I think a lot of us are, are struggling with and going through is this kind of transition of teams from these waterfall uh, siloed, the deep external handoffs, and then getting to these DevOps approaches. And what ultimately their, you know, Amplitude's view is, is the product team being kind of the, the ultimate uh, team that you would come up with that, that is, you know, the, the team itself does everything from opportunity selection through running the, those uh, digital solutions in production. And what my story personally, it, it kind of went with is starting out in like a waterfall team and through the help of you know many different players and things like that, 
we were able to, to kind of level up towards like this design as a team member, DevOps. Uh, and I, I saw quite a few people joined uh, who, who've touched and were part of that journey that the Marine Corps had uh, in this. And so that being said, you know, the, the story always starts in this ordinary world. And so for a lot of us, we, we see like, you know, this legacy IT and the status quo. There's a ton of manual work going on. Sneaker net is like where people are literally passing drives and, and, and disks and things like that to get information around. And we measure time in, in quarters and years and just everyone's okay with this. And uh, as you can see, you know, these stories that, you know, whether it's Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, uh, The Matrix, it, they all start out there. You know, just, everything's just okay. Uh, and then you get this call to adventure. And so uh, right now we, we have this call of the information age and process automation, uh, you know, having strategic advantage, near peer competition, you know, and, and things like that. And we have this sense that we can't keep up with the change and our jobs are threatened. And, you know, we kind of hear about the, these DevOps things and that, you know, hey, I, I could be a user developer. I could be someone on a team who is not only ideating a better way to solve the problem, I could be developing and releasing that solution. Uh, and so that was kind of one of the things that I heard, uh, you know, as a, a solution, that was the, the call to adventure for me. And there, there was this moment of refusing the call that, you know, we can't compete with industry. I'm not a tech person, uh, you know, and even appealing to my organization, being like, train me. And they're like, why? You'll just leave us. Uh, you know, and that's, this isn't what we do here. And, you know, you show them examples of the great things. And then they say, like, well, that won't work here. And so there, there's always kind of this refusal of the call, whether it be by an individual or a group. And typically what happens is there's this meeting of the mentor. And uh, you, you'll find that there are these kind of closet IT people and, and DevOps practitioners out there. For me, it was meeting people at Defense Digital Service, the White House Presidential Innovation Fellows, a lot of the members here from 18F, and realizing that there was a whole community out there of Code for America people and uh, active duty technologists that I had no idea were, were within our ranks, but kind of hidden by the occupation codes that we have. And then uh, some nonprofits, even like Defense Entrepreneurs Forum, where you could build these teams and kind of stand up these journeys uh, that self-organize and get after it and, and have these people can kind of guide you. Uh, so there's this crossing of the, the first fresh threshold. So uh, for me, it was joining a digital transformation project and it was, uh, you know, it had to deal with IT asset management and IT uh, lifecycle management. And, and the big struggle was, uh, we'll get, get into maybe a little bit more of what the ordeals were, but it was the transition from Windows 7 to Windows 10 and just struggling to do that. Uh, so there, there's usually these projects, there are experiments with legitimate sponsors uh, and, and this change to balance teams. So uh, design, engineering, product. And that goes back to that slide I showed of different levels of teams that uh, you build a team that has all of these capabilities within it. And when you look back at, you know, these stories that we're used to, okay, like that, that's, you know, Neo becoming a part of, of the, you know, Matrix group, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, Chewie and Han on board in Star Wars with, with going, you know, to Alderaan, uh, you know, it, with the Lord of the Rings, it's, it's getting, you know, the, the fellowship together and getting them out the door. Then, then comes the test, the allies and the enemies. And this is where the, the story gets interesting. And this is where you get like your first valuable iteration. You make something that's useful. Uh, you start figuring out who the change agents are that can actually open doors for you and get, and get you through some of these hard parts. And so for, for me, it was Defense Digital Service and we leaned heavily into the Air Force Chief Software Office. So uh, if anyone's familiar with Nicholas Shalon, he's the, he dual hats as the, the DOD's uh, DevSecOps lead, as well as uh, the Air Force Chief Software Officer. And it was, we really ran up against, uh, you know, the team found out what status quo, bureaucracy and outdated policy, uh, those were the enemy that we ran into. Uh, so those were our, our bull rocks, you know, this demon that, that like, you know, our uh, several of the members of Defense Digital Service played uh, the role kind of of Gandalf on that bridge and, you know, not letting that, that thing stop us. 
And it, it was pretty awesome moment, but there was also credibility and things traded in, in some of those sacrifices that was difficult to watch, but it got us to the next level. It got us to the next point in the journey, which was the approach to the innermost cave. And this is where teams begin running into cybersecurity, you get to encounter vaporware. So, hey, our team will be able to release this thing and we're gonna depend on this team to give us th these features and inherent these controls or, or this software as a service and everything will be great. And it turns out that it's not what it does. It's not there. Uh, so there's a lot of frustration. Uh, leadership starts to get into scope creep. So you kind of get this, you know, uh, your team starting to get productive. You were just a, a limited experiment, but now they're, they're kind of starting to invest solutions into you and expecting you to deliver the world with very minimal uh, resources. And you, your team starts realizing the severity of the tech debt that, that, that is out there. Uh, so what, what's been running in the closet, you know, how, how old is it, uh, different things that, that hold the team back they didn't realize were barriers. And then you get into like the ordeal. And so th this was, we had like a critical moment on the project where I was a, uh, a product manager for, where with authorization and accreditation, we got to this point where uh, we, we built the app, it was ready to go. Uh, we, we, could we could deploy it, we knew we could deploy it safely. Uh, but it, it just, we could not get permission. Uh, there, there were people kind of coming out of the woodworks from these uh, cost saving reform boards that at a very high executive level reporting to congressional oversight, uh, you know, asking us to justify our own existence. And, you know, we had to explain how our thing was going to save costs and things like that. And then of course the tyranny of the urgent. So uh, all these other things that would come up that the team members would get pulled away to go do and so again, that, that team not being allowed to maintain its autonomy and things like that. So challenges, the big ordeals that face the team. And we found ways again to, to push through and figure out how to get that, uh, that application that we built out into a production environment where users could access it. So that was really the reward. And so th this team started to really demonstrate potential. Uh, there were new identities formed, so we had people who really started identifying with those DevOps roles where it's like, hey, I might be the information system security person, I, but I also know that, that during a uh, planning session or during a retrospective, you know, I'm also the scrum master, I facilitate things, we, we communicate things a certain way. So these identities were, were becoming uh, formed and the challenge of increased roles and responsibilities. So with that, uh, came a lot of you know people having to to level up or or more being expected of them, and you know there, there's this road back uh, towards the the known and uh, th this full summit kind of happens and so you got through that ordeal uh, you, you you were able to prove the policy wonks wrong and things like that and there was you know this moment on the team where we were kind of bad rebels like you know we knew better than the policy people we we're just, just going to do what we want to do anyways despite the, the organization and we were kind of like patting ourselves on, on the back a little bit uh, and that wasn't going to get us where we needed to go to ultimately change you know the real uh, problem was trying to prove that these teams operating this way needs to be widely adopted in the DoD and our behavior was really prohibiting that and so we had to kind of swallow our egos, really come together with uh, you know, the organization. The frozen middle is what we were calling the bureaucrats. So we stopped calling them that. And uh, in the stories, the resurrection moment is kind of like doing what was impossible and believing in the team and then sustaining success. So for us, it was getting a full accreditation for, for this app and getting certain things uh, permissions to do certain things that like just a couple months before were deemed completely impossible. And the way that we achieved that was we kind of had to really buckle down and, and get uh, really good at understanding the policy, really good at networking and understanding like how to do what we call bureaucracy hacking. So if you know, there's a sp specific personality or person in the way, knowing exactly who and when to appeal to to, to make that happen. And then knowing that as soon as you get something released in the production, that's really when the value generation starts, that like it's not getting the thing to production, it, it's sustaining that and then creating that pattern of, of continuous feedback from users to try to improve it. And so you, there's this moment where you kind of, hey, doing things this way, returning with the elixir, it's, you know, the team's rewarded, uh, they, they take on to the next level or the team retires and spins off to other teams. 
And this is where kind of you see very different outcomes in these stories because uh, it doesn't always go well. You know, for example, and I would say that for my journey, it was the closest to, to the Lord of the Rings where, uh, you know, Frodo, based on what he has seen and experienced and done, uh, pretty much just goes off into exile. And that happens in a lot of stories because, you know, you did what you had to do and the sacrifices and things that you saw kind of like leave you on, on the kind of outside of that, that reality. And so for me personally, that, that is a little bit of what happened. And some of that's a function of the military and how our order system works. So it was just time to get orders. And some of it was, again, just choosing to, to go a different way than continuing on with those teams. So that, that kind of gets to the, you know, that's talking about the hero's journey and, you know, a little bit of an anecdote on, on what happened with me as I went through it, uh, just as a team member. Uh, but what I would like ask the audience to think about is, you know, looking at this kind of map that, that is kind of a clock and, you know, uh, these symbols and icons on it are supposed to kind of make you reflect on like, who are you in this journey? Because you're not always going to be, you know, Neo or Frodo or, you know, Luke. Sometimes you're, you're Gandalf, sometimes you're, you know, one of these side characters that are the secret to getting the team to the next level or through that specific phase. So, you know, what, what's next for you to level up? You know, sometimes uh, you, know, you have to change roles or, or change what you're doing. Uh, sometimes you're just the network. You're that thing in the middle that helps kind of route everyone around. And, you know, when does the student become the teacher? So it's this question of, you know, once, uh, you know, you go back to Star Wars, you, you have Luke eventually becomes a lot like, you know, old Ben uh, towards the end of the trilogies and things like that. And so there, there's one hero's journey, which is, you know, the one episode, uh, but then you have like this grander set of things where they repeat that pattern again. Uh, so ju just some things to think about. And then, uh, you know, made this available to everyone. I dropped the link in the chat, uh, but happy to take the, the rest of the time that we have and just kind of open it up for a discussion or some Q and A. Absolutely, Jeremy, thank you. Um, folks, if you have questions, uh, drop them in the chat. Um, one I'd have, Jeremy, is uh, just what are your thoughts around the individual versus the the group or the organizational uh, hero's journey on, on transformation? Any deep thoughts on that? It, it's the, my, my thought on it is that like both work for this pattern, that organizations in, in themselves can be, you know, the new or the Frodo. And like I've seen things like with the the Air Force and with you know uh, some of these product teams like login.gov or you know the VA and things like that, where like that entire team, that entire product team, and that part of the organization have have transformed, and now they're they're kind of in this mode of where they're facilitating and helping. Yes, there were many individuals who leveled up through through those journeys and, and had that journey, but those teams in themselves and the organizations as a whole also kind of go through that, and it's. Um, the hardest part with organizations is the organizational identity is way more lethargic than an individual's in terms of change. And so there's organizational memory and culture and things like that that just are, are harder to transform because they, they kind of are a life of their own. Yeah, thank you for that. A question from Kent. Um, you mentioned working with and around the frozen middle. Can you talk about the challenges and solutions for this part of the effort? Yeah, so a lot of it for me, it was interesting because we would meet people who uh, have 15, 20 years experience in the career field, let's say cybersecurity, and they're, they're hyper intelligent people and they know everything uh, and it's all in their head and, and they're really like these artisans. You know, a lot of what they know and the, the, what makes them valuable and experts isn't written anywhere and it's only known by them, yet they're sages, like they're, they're dependent on by senior leaders to kind of advise in certain moments. And what we found was extremely useful was figuring out what those person, what their mental model of what the DevOps pattern was, like what do they think this is? Figuring that out and really empathizing with them and trying to understand it and then convincing them to come to a demonstration or come to one of our workshops or come to one of our events and just watch and observe and, and see what happens. And, it was really difficult to do uh, with some of them. And it, with some of them, it was easy to do because they, they were intellectually curious people and they just have never been invited. And we found that when they saw what we were doing and how we were doing it, 
and when they were at the table giving us feedback on, well, you know, have you tried this? If you did this, I would support this. And seeing us immediately implement that feedback, we, we turned a lot of them to where even if they were no longer what we would call like an enemy or oppositional, th they were facilitating now, they were helping us. And so that that's, you can never uh, overestimate the amount of effort and care that those relationships are going to take. And so that, that would be my advice is turn the frozen middle into your closest ally. And you're going to have to use empathy and really get to know them and understand them to be able to achieve that. Absolutely, Jeremy. Question from Chris is, how do you tell that, uh, that hero's journey in your resume? How do you communicate that? The, the, the simple short answer that a recruiter would tell you is that you should see progression from being like a junior developer, designer, whatever, uh, leveling up into the, the senior positions and things like that. That's the simple answer. The reality that I found is that it's extremely difficult to tell that story with a resume because it's extremely difficult to have any logical progression between effort and effort. Like. I've played so many different roles. And like right now I'm trying to get software engineering skills because I see playing that role on a team uh, in the near future. And I've found that it is extremely difficult to communicate that in a resume. And, and my answer has been to have many resumes. So depending on who I'm talking to and who I'm trying to communicate to, I will customize that story because I know what effect I'm trying to have on them. I try to understand what their problem is. So whoever, is using or looking at your resume and then making sure that that resume when they look at it that you are the you're the you're the, the you know the elf or the dwarf or, or the neo that they're looking for and you know just being honest you know and not not fabricating anything but making sure that only so much can fit on a one or two page resume just making sure that those essential elements are there yeah jeremy thanks for that 